everyone. I am James Milan, and welcome to this edition of Talk of the Town. We have a legislative update for you, and we have it with our buddy, Sean Garbley. Sorry, he's not our buddy. He's our rep. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, Sean is in the house. So glad to see you, as always, Sean. Great to be here, James. Really uh, enjoy these conversations, and I know that they are just good content for our viewers as well. Um, so let me start uh, by uh, just a little recognition. I was, you know, preparing for our interview and I noticed that you're just a couple of weeks away from a, an anniversary of sorts and that you're going to be 15 years in the house pretty soon here. So just tell us your thoughts. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, that's, that's a good long tenure. You're a young man still. Um, so you got plenty of things in front of you, no doubt. But uh, you're, you're must be a senior member in the house at this point. Um, well, first of all, James, thank you for having me, and thank you to ACMI for always doing these important legislative updates. It's a great way for me to get as close to my constituents as possible, and I really appreciate that kind of service that you and the volu other volunteers here um, provide. Happy to do it. Um, so good research. Uh, <laughs> you, you really nailed it. Yep, in March, I'll be celebrating my uh, 15th uh, anniversary uh, serving the people of Arlington and Medford. Uh, in the House of Representatives. It's been the greatest honor of my life um, to, to be the representative uh, uh, here. Um, I am shocked to say that it's been uh, 15 years when I ran at the age of 22 uh, for this seat. I never would have imagined that I would be here for 15 years. And looking back at it, I can't believe it's been 15 years. But Just like that. I've learned a lot. I've worked with a lot of good people. Um, in the House to really try to deliver for the people of Massachusetts and for the people of our um, community. I think uh, together we've partnered on a whole host of issues that have been really important and really transformative in improving the quality of life for people here in our community uh, and in the city of Medford and across the Commonwealth. Um, you know, I love my job. I love doing it. Every constituent I have has my cell phone. Mm -hmm. you know, they call me on a regular basis for issues that are small or large. You know, it doesn't matter to me. It's what's important to the people I represent. Mm -hmm. And I just uh, love doing uh, this job and will continue to do it uh, until uh, the people decide that they want somebody else. Well, or, you know, <laughs> until you finally get tired of all the work that is involved in right. getting legislation passed. Uh, but but I, do, I just wanna follow up very quickly on one thing, and that is, I mean, that's a good, solid tenure in the House, and that means you've learned a whole lot of stuff that, you know, that 22-year-old, 23-year-old you just wouldn't have, wouldn't have known. Just pick one or two things that, you know, you, you really know now that you didn't know then about the way that the State House works. You know, looking at it from the outside, it can be very frustrating when you, as a constituent, see a piece of legislation that is so critically important, but it just can't get passed um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, and for me, it's really all about unintended consequences. It's how important it is to vet a bill, um, to really pay attention to the details. And as a state representative for the past 15 years, when trying to pass legislation that's taken a little longer than I would have liked for it to take to finally get it passed. Looking back at it, it's really all about building relationships and really working uh, with other legislators to get something done. Um, you know, you have a House of 160, you have a Senate of 40, and then you need to withstand a, a governor's veto mm -hmm. and get it on his or her desk. And that's not easy, and it shouldn't be easy. Not every bill is a good one, right? Um, legislation can be complicated. You need to go through it uh, line by line. And that's important. And that, you know, not everyone can be a good or effective legislator. You mm -hmm. have to be patient. You have to care about the details. And you have to be a good listener uh, above all. And so in any piece of legislation I've worked on, probably starting more in the latter year of my tenure than in the beginning, you need to bring everyone to the table, all parties, and really look through a piece of legislation and vet it from the beginning to the end. 
And that's really what makes a good piece of legislation. And that's working with 159 other colleagues. Mm -hmm. So when I'm trying to pass a piece of legislation, I literally have to meet with 159 individuals and convince them that this is the right approach for Massachusetts and that, that I've done my due diligence and research and, and, and getting the bill vetted and, and ready to get passed. Mm -hmm. And it takes a long time. Right. So, so that's probably, you know, the, the point of that is you might have entered thinking, hey, if I, have the good, if I have good ideas, if I know that this is the right thing to do, if I know that everybody agrees that it's the right thing to do, that's probably enough. Now you know it's not at all. Enough. No, not necessarily. Every issue is different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the second thing I will say, and I think I've known this from the very beginning, I don't think this is something I have learned, mm -hmm. um, is I get calls from constituents all the time. It can be in the middle of the day. It can be in the middle of the night. And as you pointed out, James, I give out my cell phone number to everybody that wants it. Most people don't want it. <laughs> but for everybody who wants it, yeah. um, when they're calling me, it's not um, necessarily because they want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we went through a pandemic that literally changed the landscape of public health, literally changed um, life for many, many people in our community, whether it was employment, whether it was losing a loved one. Um, it changed a lot of people. And when I get a call from a constituent, I really try to drop everything to help that individual because they're not calling me because they necessarily want to, some do, but they're calling me because they have to. Right. And uh, it's not necessarily a call they want to be making. Um, you know, I just got a call this morning that took an hour of my day around housing. Somebody who um, is, is unfortunately um, going through the eviction process and is trying to keep her kids in the Arlington Public Schools trying to keep food on her kids' table, right on their kids' tables, and trying to stay housed. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm trying to help her do that. Mm -hmm. So when people call me, they're calling me because they need help. Right. And that is something that I have never taken for granted these past 15 years and just becomes more important to me every time I get a phone call or an email. Well said, and, and yeah, I just want to recognize for each person who's on the other end of that line when you pick up that phone, it's probably the biggest thing in their life at that moment. And it's not the biggest thing in your life, but if you can make it that for an hour or whatever it takes to resolve, it's, it's good important. on you. It's important. Good. Um, so we're, we're speaking at the beginning of, well, middle of February at this point. Um, and, uh, and that means that a new legislative session started not too long ago. Um, but we haven't had really a chance to hear from you about the, you know, the most important stuff that came out of the last session. So let's do that relatively succinctly and then like to move right into what you are, you know, anticipating to be the big things you want to do in the current session. Great. Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Uh, we had a great legislative session the last two years uh, that ended officially. Formal session ended on July 31st. The official end of the session ended the end, at the end of the year, and we just started a brand new session on January uh, 6th. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, as the chair of global warming and climate change, um, I really focused my attention on climate change, where we passed a really comprehensive climate change piece of legislation really addressing uh, dirty sources of energy, and to try to address that issue on a whole host of matter ways, mm -hmm. um, trying to make Massachusetts the epicenter of the offshore wind industry here in the United States of America, making up at least a third of President Biden's goals for offshore wind nationwide. That's pretty important and that's pretty inspiring. And then um, as well as offshore wind, making Massachusetts a hub for electric vehicles, really trying to create the, um, the necessary, I don't wanna say energy, because no pun intended, mm -hmm. but the infrastructure necessary in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to allow electric vehicles to thrive, to have the infrastructure here that will allow it to thrive. 
Um, so I bring that bill up because it was a really important bill. And as the chair of the committee, it was something that I was directly involved in. This past session was also one of my most successful. Um, I believe, James, every time I come before you, I give a legislative update. Mm -hmm. And you graciously give me the opportunity to talk to you about bills I've been filing, bills I've been working on, and some of those bills, literally, we've been talking about for 10 years. Absolutely. Um, a few of them got passed uh, this past session. And I just want to kind of run through them real mm -hmm. quickly. Mm -hmm. um, one is during the pandemic, we talked about the importance of my bill around emergency paid sick, mm -hmm. sick leave, mm -hmm. sick days. That got passed. That allowed so many across the Commonwealth uh, get access to sick days so they couldn't, so they could take care of a loved one, take care of themselves without risking being fired. Really, really um, important. And I was proud to file that bill. Um, the uh, Macy bill, the Massachusetts, Massachusetts inclusive concurrent enrollment legislation that we've been talking about for 10 years finally passed. It makes Massachusetts the first state in the country in statute to allow students with autism and Down syndrome and other um, dis learning disabilities to be able to access college, public universities for the first time um, in, the in the country, to put it in statute. And I'm just gonna interrupt you for one second and say, I flash back as you were talking, as you were saying that, I flash back to our very first conversation <laughs> in this studio, different configuration, in which you were talking right, about that. Right. So sorry about um, for the interruption. No, James, I appreciate right. it. It's one of those bills, right, that took a lot of time to get right, mm -hmm. to kind of bring everyone to the table, to really look at each sentence of, of the bill. Um, but we finally got it passed. And it is the, I think, the most significant uh, law related to special education um, since IDEA um, passed at the federal level. It's going to transform lives. Um, students with autism and Down syndrome and other disabilities will be able to, to attend college and learn just like their peers. And that is tremendously important. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to talk about that real quick. Congratulations, by the way. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, um, it's a big one. Um, adoptees uh, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts weren't able to access their original birth certificate, right. their document that tells them who they are, their identity. Um, now, uh, the bill that I've been filing for 10 years finally got passed last session. So all adoptees born within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, within our 351 cities and towns, will each be able now, right now, because it's implemented, will be able to gain access to their original birth certificate, to the document that tells them that they are they, right, mm -hmm. who they are, um, really, really important. And the, uh, the other piece of legislation that we had talked about for a long time that finally passed this past session was those living with multiple sclerosis, that they cannot, under law, be kicked off their drug that's been working for them. Um, hundreds of those uh, in our Commonwealth living with multiple sclerosis live in fear, and it does happen where they get a letter in the mail from their insurance company that their insurance company is not going to cover mm -hmm. their prescription drug that's been working for them to help prevent flare-ups and help prevent them from having to go to the emergency room. Now, in state law, um, no one living with multiple sclerosis that's been on a drug for 30 years, that's been working for them, controlling flare-ups, keeping them out of the emergency room, will ever be uh, live in fear of being kicked off, um, kicked off their drug that's been working uh, because of bureaucrats within health insurance tell them to. Um, so that, to me, is really, really important. Mm -hmm. The last bill that we got passed was around a disability-led commission, the first of its kind, a commission that's going to be led around the history of state institutions. It's an uncomfortable history mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth. We have unmarked graves from, uh, you know, Belmont all the way to Belchertown. Um, you know, a, a letter with a number. It's not a history that we're proud of mm -hmm. here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, and this is going to be a commission to study that history. You know, those are human beings, right? Uh, they died um, under the care of the Commonwealth. 
um, are not the care of the Commonwealth, right? right? But they died with markers, with just a letter, you know, signifying if they were Catholic or Protestant mm -hmm. and a number. You don't know their history, don't even know their names. Mm -hmm. um, talk about something so dehumanizing. Yep. And this commission is going to study all that um, and report back on how to make it right and create hopefully a, um, a memorial um, to these individuals. Right, at the very least, an, an honoring of their memories. Um, e e e yeah. And, and, and a reckoning, perhaps, for and the rest, you know, for, for, for all of us. Right. Um, that is a lot, and that was a good, that was a good term. You're right, uh, for, for you and for the work that you've put in. And great examples, really, because, as you said, each one of those has a long, each one of those bills has a long history, multiple efforts uh, to make sure that they stay in, in, in progress towards the, the goal that you finally reached. And that really kind of sums up a lot of what we were talking about earlier in the conversation in terms of what you've learned over your time in the House and how much more, you know, how much patience is required and how you need to get everybody or as many on board as possible. It takes a long time and you've done it. So well done. Thank you. All right. So let's 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 face forward now um, and um, and, you know, talk to us a little bit because. One thing I've learned through these updates, I've been getting an education the whole time. One thing I know is that what you started on January 6th is a brand new term, which means everything that you were working on before, whatever stage it was at, you got to start the process at least again, right? So what's, what, what, what are the things that hopefully less than 10 years from now, you are going to be able to tell me, <laughs> I finally got this bill passed? Um, well, thanks for the question, James. That, that is right, the beginning of January. Um, I was sworn in to a new term as your state representative, as well as the 159 other state reps and 40 other state senators all um, being sworn in. The day after that, we were sworn in. We had a swearing in of a new governor and a new lieutenant governor and a brand new auditor and a brand new attorney general. Mm -hmm. Um, so we have tremendous change here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and tremendous opportunity as well. And what you did not read maybe in the news after that, after both of those swearing ins or inaugural events, um, legislators had, you know, maybe a two, three week window to file legislation. So I have been filing all of my bills. I have around 60 pieces of legislation that run the gamut on a whole host of issues around education, public higher ed, transportation, individuals with disabilities, and addressing climate change um, and housing. Um, and so now we will be working over the next two years to try to build support um, to get those done. Mm -hmm. um, and I can run down kind of my individual bills, but I think it's more important at this point, because it's kind of the first talk of the town, up legislative update for this session is mm -hmm. to kind of talk to you about the, the major pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's... So Governor, uh, uh, Governor Healy now and uh, Lieutenant Governor Driscoll just filed one of their first pieces of legislation, which is no surprise to me or to any of my viewers, it was a housing bond bill. Uh, we have a housing crisis. Mm -hmm. um, people uh, are having a very difficult time being able to stay in their homes. Uh, we need to address this. We need to do more to support individuals living in our housing authorities. We need to develop more housing stock. We need to allow for more raft vouchers and more mass rental voucher program, MRVP, the mass family, uh, mass family uh, rental voucher program to create more opportunities so people can stay in their homes. Mm -hmm. Right now we have a housing crisis. Uh, we have a... Um, lack of accountability crisis as well. We have so many people heading back into hotels, motels, which is the exact opposite of where we want to be and where we should be going. We need to we need to have these folks find permanent housing. It is absolutely critical. So I believe this term we will be coming up with a piece of housing zoning piece of legislation um, that addresses mm -hmm. this issue for a whole host of um, ways. Mm -hmm. 
That's really important. This passed on the ballot in November. The voters decided to vote for a constitutional amendment known as the Fair Share Amendment. It is also known as the Millionaire's Tax um, that uh, does a tax uh, on income of those earning more than a million dollars. So we're not talking about assets, we're talking a paycheck of more than a million dollars. And some estimates estimate that we're going to receive as much, because that did pass, some estimates say that we're going to receive as much as, you know, 1.5 to 2 billion dollars a year on revenue. Um, that our, our belief and our hope is that we're going to dedicate that revenue to public education and public transportation and infrastructure. Um, so one of the pieces of legislation I filed this session is known as the CHERISH Act. 85% uh, of our young people that leave, graduate, one of our 29 public higher education institutions from uh, community college to state university to UMass, upon graduation, they stay in the Commonwealth and they are invested in our communities in one of our 351 cities and towns, uh, but they are strapped with mm -hmm. loads of debt and costs and fees continue to rise on these students every single day and the share of the investment the Commonwealth has made to their education and to the 29 public higher education campuses has steadily decreased over the years as costs have risen from meals to textbooks to dorms. Mm -hmm. And it's really outrageous. Um, and we, as a Commonwealth, need to invest in public higher education, which is what the CHERISH Act would do, um, and would freeze tuition and fee rates, and finally invest. And I can't think of, well, there's a whole host of important things to invest in, but I can't think of something more important in terms of the economic growth of our Commonwealth than investing in our public, high, than our, our young people, our students in public higher education. So I'm hoping and we'll be working and trying to pass the Cherish Act, but make sure that part of the fair share amendment that the people voted on and supported and passed mm -hmm. will go to supporting everything from early ed, but also to public higher education. Another huge piece of that is, of course, and we were talking about it right before the program, is investing in public transportation. Mm -hmm. We have a crisis in the MBTA, um, especially here in the 23rd Middlesex District. We are able to save some of the bus routes like the 80, but it's not going to Lechmere anymore. It's going to Davis. Mm -hmm. Nearly every bus route out of Alewife, 79, was canceled. That's outrageous. Um, I've, you know, the previous GM, I spoke three or four times to him about the cuts, the draconian cuts that were made um, to the MBTA bus routes um, under the false pretense of efficiency and uh, a, a kind of a fake study that was done during COVID that ridership was down. Of course it was down. It was, it was down. For God's sake. It was down across the 175 MBTA community region, mm -hmm. right? People are coming back. And just like public higher education, if you want to grow the economy, if you want to invest in uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you have to invest in people. That's an education, that's our workforce. Guess what, you also have to transport these people to from their homes to their jobs. And because they can't count on the MBTA to get them to their work, their place of employment, they're getting in their cars, which is creating such congestion on our infrastructure that it's creating real problems. So um, one of my hopes with the fair share amendment and hoping that we'll see that kind of leadership from the Healy administration is that it is time to invest in our infrastructure, but it's time to invest in our MBTA. And the first thing we can do to get the buses back on our roads and restore our uh, public transportation is the biggest struggle we've had since COVID, um, the biggest challenge we've had is the fact that we can't hire the requisite number of our drivers, bus drivers, to be able to get buses back on the road. You can't, you can't have a service if you can't have anyone to drive the buses. And I think we all know that bus drivers are not treated well on the whole by the general public. And so I think we need to do a few things. I think one is we need to come up with a salary 
that is uh, better than that made in the past with salary and, and benefits to encourage people to become bus drivers. Mm -hmm. I think we have to find a way to treat bus drivers mm. nicer, more nicely, so that they can have the impetus to do that job. So that is what I'm really hoping that this administration will put forth and that the legislature will pass legislation to invest in um, public higher education, general ed, early ed, but also public transportation. It is critical. Well, you will truly go down in the annals of legislative genius if you're able to come up with legislation <laughs> that, help, that makes people be nicer to bus yeah. drivers and others. I think that would be great. That what, what, that we will hail that to the heavens when it happens. It's important. A couple of points in support of what you were just saying, particularly about the MBTA. We were talking before we went on air. It took you more than an hour to go the eight and a half or nine mm -hmm. miles from the state house to our studio today in your car, which you had to do because of the public transportation situation, as you said. So that's not good. And that, that feeds right into an article that I saw recently in which Boston, by, if you measure it by the t amount of time that is lost uh, in congestion, Boston is the fourth worst city in the yeah. world. In the world. Chicago's worse, apparently, right. uh, but that's the only American city. Right. You know, crazy, crazy. So you, you're not kidding when you say we have a crisis. We never think that we were more congested than L.A. You right. know, it's just Amazing, unbelievable right? to think and about. And New York, and New York. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a crazy yeah. thing. Um, all right, so we, we have... As usual, we've, we have filled up the, the half hour in no time at all. Um, I will save for future, uh, for future conversations, um, you know, getting your thoughts on, well, let me just ask you in the minute that we have left, what do you think about the, the, the big changes as you already cited in Massachusetts here, especially in the governor's mansion, lieutenant governor, attorney general, et cetera? What, what do you think? I think it's exciting. You know, uh, Maura Healy is not new to state politics, right? She served as our attorney general for the past eight years. Kim Driscoll, our new lieutenant governor, is new to the state house, but she's not new to governing. She mm -hmm. was uh, the mayor of Salem, a great city for, for almost two decades, I believe. So these are two individuals that are, are, are used to getting work done and rolling up their sleeves. I'm excited to be able to work um, with them. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of challenges here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I highlighted a bunch of them. Um, I've already had several conversations with the lieutenant governor, who I think is going to be a really hands-on lieutenant governor, as will um, the governor. Mm -hmm. And I think their, their attitude, and I think one of the, the benefits of um, both of them being in government um, in Massachusetts is that they know the legislature. They know the legislature, how it works. They know that they need to be partners and they want to be partners in this work. And that's really, really important in being able to get things done is to have a governor who's going to meet with legislators, who's going to um, meet with the speaker and the Senate president to collaborate on getting things done. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to agree 100 percent of the time on everything. Uh, that doesn't happen in the House. That doesn't happen in the Senate. And it's not going to happen between the legislature and the governor. Right. Um, but we've made a commitment uh, to work with each other to get things done. That's the way she's acted as attorney general, right? We've worked together on a whole host of issues uh, to make positive progress. And I, I have no reason to suspect that that won't happen or continue to happen these next four years as she serves as our governor. Well, I'll tell you what, Massachusetts, there, there's a lot of grim news out there in the wider world. Massachusetts is a nice place to hunker down and <laughs> try and get it right. Lots of, lots of problems to address, as you mentioned, but also a uh, good reason for hope. So there you have it. Um, I have been speaking, of course, with Sean Garbley, who is our representative here in Arlington and with a little bit of West Medford thrown in as well. Um, and uh, this has been a legislative update for Talk of the Town. We really appreciate Sean's time always. Thank you, James. Thank you very much. And we appreciate yours as well. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm James Milan. We'll see you next time.